Today's keynote is called Five Years of Angular, and this will tell the past, present, and future of Angular and my involvement with the project since March of 2013. So I'm hoping to reach out to all the designers, engineers, developers, business people, and Vikings in the audience. Thank you for being here. So that is a link to the slides. I will tweet this out right after this presentation is done, so don't worry. Once again, five years of Angular. There's a lot of stuff here that tells my journey. If I have to take Angular and summarize what Angular is into a few sentences, it is basically a platform for building sophisticated web applications. And by platform, that means that you can add, mix and match different technologies to make a very powerful, sophisticated web application. The conference that you guys are about to embark on is going to be for two days, and we have over 40 talks with close to 50 presenters about everything and everything about Angular and related web technologies. We have a lot of talent at this conference, people from all over the world. It's very nice that everyone here has met in Finland. Be sure to see tomorrow's keynote, which takes place at the same time. John Papa from Microsoft is going to talk about Angular and deploying Node to the cloud. So, information about myself. I am a core developer on the Angular team. I work for Google in Mountain View, California, and I live in San Francisco. I've been involved with Angular for five years. Three of those years have been at Google, and I've been building websites for almost half of my life, 15 years. And yes, I am from Finland. Tervetuloa. So, five years of Angular. We'll talk about the past, the present, and the future of where Angular is going. And to jump into the past, let's talk about how I got involved on the project. And I like to call this story the animation story of Angular. So, before Angular, I was working as a freelance developer, and I had been building websites for a very long time. Throughout my adolescence and being a student, I had a lot of opportunities to prove myself to develop all kinds of websites from back-end to front-end to content to design to animations to ads, everything and everything involving with web design and development. If you go back 15 years, this is the time when we had blink tags and browsers. You know, there weren't any frameworks around. We only had simple JavaScript libraries. And you know, something as sophisticated as Angular was only a dream back then. But you know, everybody starts off with older technologies, and these technologies improve over time. <coughs> Oops. <laughs> that was not intended. Um, so, at the time when I was a freelance developer, just before I got involved in Angular, I was living in Toronto, Canada, and I was playing around with a lot of really cool web technologies. One in particular which I had a really big passion for was MooTools. And this is a front-end library which had, I would say, the best animations, the best UI widgets and elements that were around. And Building websites, being a freelance developer, allowed me to really exercise and play around with these amazing tools. I also did a lot of back-end stuff with Rails and Node. But ultimately, the big thing that caught my attention each time was the front-end, especially the UI, the UX, and the design. That stuff still is of great passion to me, and I really, really enjoy developing and making UIs really nice and pretty. So being a freelance developer, you come across technologies all the time. And AngularJS came up on my radar. Now, I was, at the time, I was building a fitness tracking website. And I had to choose between you know, having a library or having a true framework. And I chose Angular. And it was actually funny, because back then, I had a 50-50 chance you know, whether I use Angular or another framework. So I'm very happy I chose Angular, otherwise I wouldn't be here. 
So along comes this framework that's developed by Google that encourages testing and reusability across the board. I was very excited to use it, but at first glance, it was really strange. The HTML code had all these weird tags in there. I was like, why do I have to have an ng click? I thought that on click, that, all that kind of stuff was not a part of the HTML anymore. I thought it was in JavaScript. And I never read the documentation. I just kept, <laughs> kept trying things until they worked. But ultimately, I figured it out, but I still found it very hard. And the thing that got me to get good at Angular, to really understand it inside out, was contributing. So I, I, I figured if I could better involve myself in teaching Angular, making videos, making tutorials, I could become an expert eventually. So I focused on contributing. I made blog posts, I talked to people in the community, and you know, this is my very first blog post about Angular, uh, my website, yearofmoo.com. And uh, basically, these website, these articles started to take off. I was very surprised to see that people were interested in learning AngularJS and were interested in the material I had to contribute. One post which was really popular was the one that talked about search engine optimization. And if you can see the date right there, it says November 7th, 2012. <laughs> so it's been five and a half years <laughs> since this post went online, but it was very popular because a lot of people were hung up on the fact that these JavaScript frameworks were incompatible with search engines, but this blog post that I put together kind of proved that it is possible to have your cake and eat it too with these JavaScript frameworks. Another thing I did is I proofread books, in particular the AngularJS book from O'Reilly that Brad Green, the directing manager of Angular, wrote. He gave that book to me to read and I read it in one evening. I started at 8, 8 p.m. and I finished at 4 a.m. because I really wanted to contribute. So after having a lot of success blogging about Angular and getting involved in the community, I uh, decided to email the head developer of Angular. And I opened up Gmail and I contacted Mishko. Mishko is the lead programmer. He's the guy who came up with Angular. And I kind of mentioned to him that, hey, I have all these good ideas for Angular. And you know, like I'm sure you know who I am. I've made all these blog posts. I want to blog about more stuff. I want to contribute about more stuff about Angular. But you know, like the framework is coming out with different things that I'm interested in. How could I get better involved? And here's a list of my ideas. So Mishko's response was, do you want to do documentation? <laughs> and I was very excited. I was like, of course. Yeah, that's a great way to get started. I will definitely do this. But in True honesty, I only did documentation for one day <laughs> because the next day he handed me a design doc for animations in Angular. And I was so excited and so happy to take this on. And next thing I know, me and Mishko and another lead programmer on the Angular project, Igor, are all working together to build animations into AngularJS. And this is why this is called the animation story. After about a month of working together, we landed the first patch of Angular animations into AngularJS Master. And this was announced at a meetup at Google. And I was very proud that Mishko mentioned my name and said that I had helped out to make this possible. And after a while, all kinds of cool demos started popping up. I made more blog posts about animations. And it was really, really cool to see something that you've created from scratch land into a big framework and to see other people using it. So this kind of set the path to Angular 2. I was working on the framework in other parts as well. I was doing forms. I was looking into the compiler. But the big thing that kind of led us in the direction of Angular 2 was Angular Dart. Now, Angular Dart is not really relevant anymore with Angular. But the Dart programming language, which is a really rich front-end programming language developed by Google, kind of gave insights to the team. 
it told us that, hey, instead of having JavaScript with all the mess and all the flexibility and dynamic, dynamic properties of, uh, of JavaScript, here's a programming language called Dart, which has types, it has classes, it has annotations. And while we have such things as TypeScript nowadays, at the time, Dart was a really nice addition to Angular because it was really hard to develop a new framework with another programming language. But for me and the rest of the team in Angular, it kind of led us in the direction of ECMAScript 6 and TypeScript. So we continued to develop Angular Dart, and we continued to build insights about Angular 2. And we had conferences coming up about Angular, and everybody was getting involved. This is the first team photo of all of us at the first ng-conf back in 2014. And then there came other conferences where we got to present more ng-conf conferences. And you know, I was very happy. This was a very fun time in my life. I was presenting about Angular. I was contributing. And I was getting paid to work on this amazing framework. So after doing this for about a year and a half, it was you know, time to move on to something bigger. And that's when I applied to Google, did my interviews, got lucky I got in, and I moved to San Francisco to work for the company on Angular. And I've been doing this now for three years. I've met a lot of people. I've met a lot of really talented people and grown a lot as a software engineer. This is close to two and a half years ago. You can see Maxim is right behind me. Uh, this is in California. This is all the GDEs as well as other key figures in the Angular project. And you know, a lot of talent, a lot of wonderful people in this photo. And yeah, that's, that's what the, the story has been so far. So then in the fall of 2016, we landed Angular 2.0. We're all very excited in that photo. I'm in the middle. I'm very excited myself <laughs> to see that Angular finally got to a stable release for the next version. Once we landed Angular 2, I continued to work on animations and other parts of the library, making nice demos and pushing the limits of the framework. And now we are at Angular 5.0. Actually, it's 5.2, but the major version is Angular 5. Back a few months ago, I was very proud to cut the release for Angular 5.0. And now that brings us to NG Vikings and to Finland and to present day Angular. So, Angular today. Angular today, Angular 5, is more popular than AngularJS was before. More developers are using it, more cool applications and projects are showing up on the internet. It's really great to see that the framework is taking off. Next week, we'll have the first RC for Angular 6. And then in the spring, we'll have the final for 6.0. Once that's released, we will head in the direction of Angular 7. Right now, with Angular 5.2, there's been a lot of improvements across the board. We have done a lot of stuff of code reduction to make both the bundle size and the application size of Angular smaller. This allows for an Angular application to boot up much faster than it did in previous versions. The polyfills and dependencies on Angular have also been cleaned up. One example is the web animations polyfill is no longer required for Angular. So that saves you various kilobytes and it actually performs better. The HTTP module in Angular, the Angular Common HTTP module is a nice new set of HTTP features that you can use with your Angular application. The AOT mode is on, and Angular CLI, and tons of more stuff. So with today's talk and the stuff that I want to go over in detail, I'd like to talk about how Angular is used inside of Google, how having such a big, profound, amazing open source library for free is capable with a big company like Google, how that all works together. And then all of the external companies and projects and websites that use Angular, as well as the influence that TypeScript has, another big, large open source project on Angular. 
Then we have Rx, which is the observable streamed library that's used with Angular, which is also open source. And then we have something called the Angular CLI, which allows you to bundle and package and build and distribute an Angular application from the command line. With the CLI, there is a new tool that is now integrated into it called Bazel. I will talk about this. And then I'll jump into progressive web apps and kind of set the idea into your head to understand how these progressive web apps work in Angular. Then we have something called Firebase. And Firebase is basically a backend that allows for real-time communication with your application and is a nice extension with the topic of progressive web apps. Then I'll talk about Angular Material, talk about some of the components that have been launched, and plans for something called the Angular Material CDK. Then we'll talk about animations. This is my logo for animations. It's the Finnish Angular Viking Man. Um, and finally, we'll talk about Angular Elements. So, Google. Google is a big company. There are a lot of frameworks and platforms and projects within the company. But when it comes down to it, for something to be open source and for something to be free and available from a big company, it has to benefit the company internally as well. There are tons of applications within Google that use Angular. If you contact a recruiter, that is using an Angular application. If you provide feedback, that is using an Angular application. And there are a ton of existing Angular JS applications that are migrating towards Angular 2. So just because there's a, a lot of projects in a company doesn't really mean much. But with Google, every time Angular is updated, this stuff is tested across the company. If I make a patch into animations, if I make a patch into the compiler, it will automatically test it across every single application within the company, and it will tell me if it has failed or passed. And we have a strict policy on the team that if it fails within Google, we won't push it into the project. So we have to hop into each of these projects, update the code, make sure the tests work. And overall, this is a gigantic benefit to both Google and the open source world with Angular because we have a lot of testing code. We have a lot of stuff that gets covered. So this is what it looks like when I make a new patch into Angular. You can see that Travis, which is all of our unit tests, gets tested. And then we have linting tools, but at the very bottom we have the Google internal tests that are tested against. So we get all this nice feedback, and that gives us the confidence to make changes in the framework and to know that things work down the road. Google Shopping Express is an external website. It's not internal to Google, but this is built with the latest and greatest of what Angular has to offer. It has nice plugins and UI components built with material and animations as well. Also, if you are hosting a website using the Google Cloud Platform, this is also built with Angular. So when it comes down to testing, because it's a big part of Google and a big part of Angular's philosophy, if this is new stuff to you and you want to learn how testing works, be sure to watch this Carl's talk later today where he talks about testing with Angular. So I mentioned that there's a lot of external stuff using Angular. Well, of course there is. We are all outside of the company of Google. We are all building and developing applications that work with Angular. So these are both big and small websites, but there are a lot of big companies using Angular as well. Amadeus, for example. This, every time you book an airline ticket with Amadeus, that is Angular running in the background. And Amadeus is connected to various other airlines as well. So next time you book an airline ticket and you see an animation happening, you can think of Angular and you can think of me. And if it fails, and you, know, you can send me an email. <laughs> Ryan Air also has room bookings. This is a small application built with Angular. You can see what the prices are in Finland for two weeks. And if you want to hire a freelancer for a project, the freelancer.com website is built with Angular as well. This is just a small subset 
of the Angular applications that are available out on the open web. So Angular is an open source project. It has versioning and it has features that are used across the internet. TypeScript is also one of these. Now, I will say that TypeScript is one of the best things to happen to JavaScript and front-end development in a very long time. It's built within Angular. Angular uses it across the board. And this gives us sophisticated tooling to know that you know, if there's linting errors, if there's JavaScript grammar errors, or if the overall object structure doesn't fall into place. It also allows us to analyze and understand context of the application without having to run it. This is just a small example of TypeScript can do. Now, if you take any JavaScript editor, it has these capabilities as well. But this is built into TypeScript so that if we compile it from the command line, we can know all of the errors up front. Another really big, amazing open source tool that we use in Angular is called Rx, which is Reactive Extensions. Basically, this is a streaming library that's used with HTTP and other parts of the framework. And the big thing with Angular 5 is that we have done a lot of work within Rx and within Angular to reduce the code size of both projects and to make Angular 5 and Angular 6 much faster and smaller. If you're interested to understand and learn more about Rx and how all of this works, have a look at Sanders' talk, which is today at 11.15. And if you want to learn more of the advanced stuff, have a look at Michael's talk, where he talks about real-time stuff with Rx, which is tomorrow. So if you were to open up your laptop and create an Angular application from scratch, you would use the Angular CLI. This is a command line terminal tool where you can scaffold and build <laughs> Angular applications from scratch. Now, you may think that the CLI is just you know, a tool that sits in the terminal, which is really just designed to make building Angular applications from scratch easier. But there's a lot to it. When you build an application, you need packaging. You need the wiring of everything to fall together. And the Angular CLI keeps up with each of the versions of Angular and allows for all this stuff to happen without having to have any complexity arise to the developer. The defaults are really nice. The defaults allow us to kind of figure out what the user wants ahead of time, and that way you can get to a hello world much faster. Testing is also built into the CLI, and we have commands to run unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. And as I mentioned, when you build an application, you can scaffold components. You can generate directives and services directly from the command line. An extension to this, which is now becoming a bigger and bigger thing and in the Angular CLI, is the feature of schematics. Schematics allow us to make a recipe to describe how a certain operation happens on your project. So say, for example, you're migrating from Angular 6 to 7 in the future, there could be a schematic which could help the process of updating be much faster and much more easier. And of course, the big new feature that's coming into the CLI is Bazel. What Bazel is, is a build tool which allows you to connect different targets. Say you have your Angular application, you have your testing code, you have your bundling, and it's able to wire it all together into one tool. So Angular Core uses Bazel right now. We don't use Webpack, or we, we, we don't use a packaging system that we built from scratch. We instead, we use Bazel, and this has actually improved the development time of us building the framework. And the Angular CLI will have it baked into, into itself. You can choose between Webpack or Bazel in future versions. If you're interested to learn about schematics and how they work with Angular CLI, have a look at Manfred's talk, which is later today. And James Henry from Narwhal is also here to talk about how the Narwhal project, NX, has taken what the CLI has to offer and extended it so it works on an enterprise scale for large applications. So progressive web apps, these are all the nice and amazing things coming into browsers in the future. And Safari supports, Safari has 
support for progressive web apps. But what are these things exactly? Well, if you have your mobile phone and you go to a website that is a progressive web app, then it feels like a na natural experience. It feels like you're using an application that was built using a native language. And with PWAs, we can progressively enhance, we can add more and more features to make the application experience on a mobile phone or on a desktop feel as natural as possible. The way that all of this stuff works behind the scenes is using something called the service worker, which is basically another process running in the background that can download and pull in data without having to revisit the website in the browser. A big feature of this is caching, so that you can view the website offline after you've visited it before, thanks to the service worker. And you might be wondering, well, what does Angular have to offer with PWAs? Well, we have an Angular module called the Angular Service Worker module. And for future versions of Angular, we're looking into ways of offloading bits and pieces of the framework to be done in a service worker, which enables us to do a lot more things and can really speed up the framework itself and development with the framework as well. If you visit angular.io and you open up the command line or the, the inspector, you can see here that we have a service worker running in the background already. And if you create a new Angular CLI project, you can actually tell it to load up a service worker so you don't have to configure it yourself. A website called StackBlitz, which allows you to run an Angular application in the website and edit it, uses service worker behind the scenes. This will download NPM packages, do a lot of really crazy computation stuff, but it's all being done in the service worker and not in the browser directly. And this means that when you revisit the website, it has all the stuff cached and ready to go the next time. Here's a blog post written by Maxime that talks about how the service worker works and how to hook it up to an Angular application. Of course, at the conference, we do have presentations that talk about progressive web apps. Simona is going to talk right after this talk about how progressive web apps work with Angular. And Majid is going to talk tomorrow about how the offline caching in a progressive web app can be done and hooked up with Angular to allow for a, an app-like experience even when you're not online. So I mentioned that a progressive web app, the ex natural extension is to figure out how the data comes in and out of the application. Another Google product called Firebase allows you to connect your Angular application to a real-time backend to pull and push data. This stuff can also be done for a service worker. And Eric, tomorrow, who is also from Google, is going to talk about how to hook up a progressive web app with Firebase. And we have another talk which talks about WebSockets, which will also take place today. And since WebSockets are the lower level component of Firebase, if you're interested to see how the real-time communication can work with a backend using WebSockets, this talk will go over all of that. Angular Material. This is the UI plugin visual component library of Angular. The whole point of Material is to provide reusable components that you can use in your Angular application. The tree and the data table are two examples of very new and sophisticated components that have been added into Angular Material. And with new versions of the Material, we've been improving accessibility, and we've introduced something called the CDK, which basically takes the lower level bits and pieces of a component and allows you to use those pieces and components to build more sophisticated components. With future versions of Material, we'll be tying into the Angular CLI schematics so you can scaffold examples of different Material components without having to include them into your application through the code. And we'll also have support for the CDK to introduce the lower level animations with the Material directly so you can reuse these animations in your application. The 
material.angular.io website has all of the components listed, and it also talks about the CDK. So let's talk about my favorite feature of Angular, which is the animation support. Angular is one of the few frameworks that supports multiple element animations. <coughs> Sorry. The multiple element animations allow you to choreograph an animation to happen across multiple elements across a timeline that can occur between route changes and element, trans element changes across an application. We have scrubbing support, which means that you can build an animation timeline and you can access you know, the animation at 0%, 50%, or change it across time with a dial. And recently, we've been improving the Safari support as well as the documentation with the animation code. And with the most recent release of Angular, which came out a few hours ago, we've removed the need to have the web animations polyfill, which greatly reduces the need to have extra code in your application and actually improves the performance of Angular's animation code. Finally, as I mentioned, the Material CDK will soon be distributing reusable animations as a part of its tool, tool chain. If you are interested to see animations in their full glory, let's take a look at a website that was created for Angular Connect back in the fall. So this website is a website that me and Lucas Rubelke put together. It showcases all of the animation features that are possible with Angular. Here we have an animation that takes place across multiple elements using all kinds of cool staggering techniques. We have router support so we can jump between pages and have the animations come together. If we go into here, we can see the scrubbing support that's available with these animations. These are all the features that are available now with Angular's animations in 5. And with 6 and 7, we'll continue to see even more features coming to the framework. If you're interested to see and learn about animations from start to finish, have a look at Lucas Rubelke's talk from Angular Connect. OK, so a fairly new feature that's landing in Angular is called Angular Elements. And the name itself isn't really too descriptive. But let's say that I have a component, a calendar application that I've been working on. And it looks really pretty and really nice. But I want to use it on an application that isn't an Angular application. Now, it, with, with some you know, configuration and moving files around, this might be possible. But the whole purpose of Angular Elements is to allow this stuff to be done in a very easy way. So you can export the calendar application as a web component and have it work without having to wire up the inner Angular application with the outer application. So if we look at this, here we have an example of a web component that says, hello, hello world. Let's go into the HTML, and let's change some things around. So if I edit this HTML code, say I say, hello world 2, you can see that the component disappears. Because hello world 2 is not a registered web component. But if I change it back, Angular will load the application as a web component, bootstrap it automatically. So this means that you can have external code take each of the components and just put them into the HTML. Doesn't have to do anything else. So let's, let's see. If I copy this, let's edit the HTML here. Let me re reload the page. You can see here that each of these are instances of an Angular application within a web component. And this is possible using Angular Elements. If you're interested to learn how all this stuff works from start to finish, have a look at Pascal's talk t today, where he talks about Angular Elements. And given that an Angular Element is a reusable component that can be used across the board, have a look at Yuan's talk where he talks about building components into reusable libraries, 
as well as Yuri's talk where he talks about how to version and publish a library that's a component or a usable feature in Angular to the web. So let's talk about the final part, something called ng-iv. Now the name ng-iv is just a code name. It doesn't really tell us much. But the sole purpose of ng-iv is that we can refactor and change Angular to be much, much smaller. What we're working on is a refactoring of the render so that the size will be smaller, the debugging will be easier, and all of this stuff is available and possible with a feature called tree shaking. So if you think about it, if you shake a tree and a bunch of apples fall out, and those apples are not connected to the overall structure of the tree anymore. The same thing happens with code. If you can tree shake your code, it can delete dead code or code that isn't used in your application. So if you think about a framework, Angular has all of these things that are available for you to use in your application. But if you only use one thing, you shouldn't have to download the entire framework. And it shouldn't be up to the developer to figure out what things are included and what things they need to include into their application. Instead, the framework should be smart enough to know exactly what's used and what should be delivered to the user. And for all the stuff that isn't used right away, you can use lazy loading. And this will be built into Ivy, so you can lazy load things such as animations and you know, forms and all these additional modules. They don't have to be a part of the core. And given that we have this refactoring going on, if we can reduce an Angular application to be kilobytes in size, that means that we can have reusable Angular components that can be used in other websites using Angular elements. So this stuff is really abstract. Um, let's take a look at a demo, and I'll show you exactly what it's all about. So let's go to a local host. Oops, that was the wrong one. OK, let me turn on these things. So. I have two applications here. I'm going to open up my editor so you can see them. So I have IV code size, which is the new Angular 6 plus Angular application. And then we have ng code size, which is just something I used with Angular CLI to scaffold a Hello World application in Angular 5. Both of these projects have an H3 tag which says hello world with a binding. So that's what that looks like in Ivy. And if we look at the regular Angular application, you can see that the template code is no different. So I'm going to serve, load up this application. Oops. OK. So that's building the application using the Angular CLI code. And that's ready. And that's ready in a minute. OK, there we go. So nothing special with this application. It just says, hello world. This is the regular Angular application. Let's take a look at the network request. Let's see how much gets downloaded. If you look at the bottom of the page, you can see it says 7.7 .7 megabytes for this Angular application to load. This is including all the polyfills. It's including the entire framework that needs to be run just so you can have an application that says, hello, world. OK, well, let's go into the other application built with Ivy. You can see it says, hello, world, as well. Nothing special. But what happens now when I load the network tab? 9.6 kilobytes. <laughs> So down from something that's multiple megabytes to something that's not even 10 kilobytes is what Ivy is all about. Now, this number could grow because we're adding more and more features to Ivy and making it more feature complete. But a factor of 100 is a pretty good step in the right direction. <laughs> so. That code that you just saw there with the 9.6 is actually uncompressed. 
So let's take a look at a demo application, the same demo application of Hello World. And let's load the network tab one more time. Refresh, 3.8 kilobytes. So this is a factor of 200 now. <laughs> and we'll continue to see Angular IV and Angular Elements bringing all kinds of cool possibilities with Angular in the future, and they don't have to be megabytes in size. If you go to iv.angular.io, you can see the status of this refactoring and what it's all about, what features have been implemented, and what the roadmap looks like. And Angular Labs talks about all these things coming into IV, so you can follow up with what's going on there. And the blog posts will explain all the new stuff that's coming in this refactoring. So some final words. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have told you about all this cool stuff coming in Angular. And I'm very happy that it's been five years of working on this amazing tool. For anybody who's interested in you know, contributing more, then whatever you put out there, like blog posts or videos, the Angular community will love it. And hard work always pays off. So if you have something to share, if you have something to contribute, please do contribute it to the Angular ecosystem. Thank you.